one. Hello, and welcome to our town hall fighting for justice in South Texas, Texas, hosted by Senator Bernie Sanders. I'm Misty Rebick. Thank you for joining our show tonight. We're going to be hearing from folks on the ground in South Texas, from Rio Grande, Grande Valley to Laredo to McAllen and more. Folks who are showing up every single day in their communities to continue to fight for justice. And we have special guest Jessica Cisneros, who made headlines earlier this year when she ran a primary challenge as a 26 year old first time candidate. So we have a great show lined up for you tonight. It is the Sunday night before the most important election in modern history. And Texas is a hotly contested state right now. We're watching several races. Texas could send a few new progressive members to Congress. And as Senator Sanders said, says, as goes Texas, so goes America. So thank you for joining us tonight. If you are in our webinar, please say hello in the chat. Tell us where you're joining from. I see folks joining right now. Would love to give you some shout outs. Um, and stay tuned as we will be hearing very shortly um, from folks on the ground in South Texas. But first, let's take a brief look at a short video, just sort of recapping what's been happening on the ground there in Texas. The situation in the Rio Grande Valley in Texas right now is well and truly dire. The southern tip of Texas, a surge of COVID cases, is ravaging the tight-knit communities that straddle the U.S.-Mexico border. The U.S. has a per capita rate of infection about four times that of Mexico. The border doesn't have a border for disease. The predominantly Hispanic community is one of the nation's poorest. All these factors create a perfect storm for the virus to flourish. We have reported on Hidalgo County specifically. Hidalgo County is the home of McAllen, Texas. I'm honored to be in McAllen, Texas with the heroes of Border Patrol, and they are heroes. Border Patrol ICE, you take so much abuse from people that don't know what they're talking about. Donald Trump declaring that he will suspend immigration into the United States via an executive order. Immigration and Customs Enforcement says it made more than 2,000 arrests during a six-week nationwide operation. Today, the administration said that it will try to find ways to wind down and limit a program that protects dreamers from deportation. Yeah, I begin by recognizing the steadfast fast leadership of President Trump. Without the president's vision and dedication, we would not be here today to celebrate the construction of nearly 400 miles of new state-of-the-art border wall system. Uh, you have a friend with this administration and you have a friend with me. Nobody does a better job. So we have a lot to talk about tonight. We have just two days until the election, folks. So we are focused on South Texas tonight and what we have to do to defeat Donald Trump. Thank you again for joining us tonight. And now our first guest, born and raised in South Texas, who's been organizing since she was just 19 years old. And she's working around the clock to mobilize voters in South Texas. I've been talking to her all week. She's been working very hard. And I think uh, I had leftover pizza for lunch today because she's working so hard to get you out to vote. So with that, um, let me welcome Ari Acevedo. Welcome to the show, Ari. Hi, Misty. Thank you so much. And thank you, everyone um, who's here and helped make this happen tonight. Um, I think my mom is watching, and if she heard what I had for lunch today, she's probably like cringing right now. Um, but yes, thank you so much for everyone um, who helped put this together, who's here tonight, Senator Sanders, for giving us this platform um, to talk about the things and highlight the things that are going on here in South Texas. You know, as many and most of you know, we are on the verge of flipping South Texas blue. Um, you can argue that Texas is already a blue state. It just comes down to voter turnout. Um, and you know, when we all come together to turn out voters, we are gonna flip Texas blue. Um, so with that being said, we have some really awesome volunteer opportunities um, for all of you folks watching um, to help get involved and flip Texas blue. Um, hopefully it's showing on the screen right now, the links. Um, that we have, um, you know, it is really excited to see all of the efforts being made um, right now by all of these really awesome organizations. Uh, the people that you're going to hear from this evening are folks who've been doing the work uh, to, you know, build power in our communities. Um, and those people are going to continue doing this long after November 3rd. Uh, so we're really 
happy to have you all here. Please, please, please sign up to volunteer. Um, and with that being said, um, I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Senator Sanders, um, who you know has definitely inspired me as a younger person. Um, I got to see him in 2015 speak when I was um, in college in New Orleans. Um, and that was very exciting. And so it's exciting to be here with him now. So Senator Sanders, thank you so much for being here today. Well, Ari, thank you for the introduction and thank you so much uh, for the terribly, terribly important work you are doing. Um, as Ari indicated, folks, we are looking at not only the most important election in our lifetimes, truth is this is the most important election in the modern history of the United States of America. And the differences between the two candidates are unbelievably wide. And let me just suggest to everybody why it is absolutely imperative that they come out and vote on Tuesday. And I wanna take this opportunity, by the way, to congratulate the people of Texas. Whole country is looking at Texas and they're seeing an unprecedented increase in voter turnout. You in Texas have already cast more votes in this election than you did in 2016. And we have not yet reached election day. So that's pretty extraordinary. But as much as you have done, we've got to do a little bit more. We've got to drag out everybody that we know, our friends and our families and our coworkers and our co-students. We got to get them out to vote, and I will tell you why. Because the differences between these candidates is a mile wide. Now, let me just go over briefly some of them. Let's just say you're out there in South Texas and you're working for 10, 12 bucks an hour. You can't make it on those starvation wages. Joe Biden wants to raise the minimum wage to 15 bucks an hour. Joe Biden believes that women should receive equal pay for equal work. Joe Biden believes that we have got to make it easier for workers to join unions so they can get decent wages and benefits through collective bargaining. Joe Biden believes that we have to create millions of good paying jobs by rebuilding our crumbling infrastructure. And that's our roads, our bridges, water systems, wastewater plants, schools, building affordable housing. Joe Biden understands that working class families today are having a hard time sending their kids to college. That's why he intends to make public colleges and universities and trade schools tuition free for all working class families and take a significant step forward in canceling student debt. Joe Biden understands that health care is a human right. And I know when we talk about the health care crisis, you guys in Texas understand it better than perhaps any other state because you have so many people who are uninsured or underinsured. Now, in Donald Trump, we have a president who wants to repeal the Affordable Care Act and throw some 22 million people off the health care that they now have. Biden wants to expand health care. He wants to double funding for community health centers. And another issue of very great importance to the whole world, but especially maybe to South Texas, is the issue of climate change. In President Trump, you have a president who doesn't even recognize the reality of climate change. In fact, through his policies, he has made a bad situation worse. Biden is prepared to spend $2 trillion, that's a lot of money, to transform our energy system away from fossil fuel to energy efficiency and sustainable energy. So add all of that up and add to it the fact that it is absolutely imperative that we get rid of a president who is a pathological liar, a president who does not believe in science. Now you cannot run a government in the 21st century with a president who does not believe in science. And we're seeing that right now in terms of the COVID-19 pandemic. Trump goes around the country right now, right now. He's probably giving a speech right this moment. He says, we are turning the corner on COVID-19. It's a lie. We are seeing, in fact, more cases 
of COVID-19 right now than we have ever seen before. And as winter approaches us, the more people are gonna be indoors, the problem will likely get even worse. We are not going to solve or effectively address the COVID-19 pandemic unless we have a president who believes in science, who is gonna give us national guidelines for all of our states and cities and towns as to how we can best go forward. Biden believes in science, will rely on scientists, Trump does not. And that is a fundamental difference. So right now in this historically important moment, when we have a president who lies all the time, who does not believe in science, in fact, who is trying to undermine American democracy. I believe and you believe that we've got to make it as easy as possible for people to vote and participate in our democracy. Trump and his Republican friends in Austin and all over this country are trying to make it harder for people to vote, make it harder to count the ballots. And that's not what we should be doing. So right now we've got a few days left in order to do everything that we can to bring out the vote. So what I'm asking you tonight is not only to vote yourself, that's an easy ask. I'm asking you to find somebody who's kind of reluctant, maybe has never voted. Uh, I'm asking you to bring that person to the polls. And while it may be uncomfortable for you to do that, no one likes to kind of drag or harangue your friends, it is very important. It's important that you be kind of uncomfortable today doing that rather than uncomfortable on Wednesday morning when you find that Trump won Texas by a few votes. So as somebody who first became elected mayor way back when in Burlington, Vermont, by all of 10 votes after a recount, I can tell you every vote counts. So let us in the next two days do everything that we can to grow the voter turnout and to see that Joe Biden becomes our next president and to see that all over the state we elect strong progressive candidates. Uh, thank you very, very much. And now it is my uh, pleasure to introduce somebody I think many of you in South Texas already know, and that is Jessica Cisneros. Uh, Jessica is an immigration and human rights attorney who was born and raised in Laredo. Uh, she made headlines earlier this year uh, for running a primary congressional challenge as a 26-year-old first-time candidate against Henry Quillar, and she earned over 48% of the vote. That's not, that's not too bad. That's pretty good. Jessica, thanks so much for being with us and for the work you're doing. Thank you, Senator. And I just want to give, I guess, a heads up for everybody. It seems we, tie, we timed today's town hall with somebody's sixth birthday party outside. So if you hear honks, we'd like to think of their, their GOTV rallying out there. But um, I, anyway, thank you so much for your introduction. And thank you for hosting um, you know, this Fighting for Justice in South Texas town hall. Um, thank you to all of you who are joining tonight and are watching across the country. And I'd like to give a very special shout out to all mi gente from the 956 who are watching from home and also all of y'all who are on the panel as well. Before we dive into this conversation about issues that we face here in South Texas, I'd like to provide some current context to our conversation. I think the video did very well in explaining some of those um, bits of knowledge that you need to know about what's happening on the border right now. Like many, like many places across this country, the last few months, the virus pandemic has set ablaze many of the crises our communities have been facing. However, this area of the country hasn't fared as well as most other places due to the prior circumstances and also the blatant lack of resources. Before the pandemic, there were one, like one fourth of the people down here in South Texas did not have health insurance. And we also had about a 30% poverty rate. And again, these are pre-pandemic numbers. The pandemic obviously has made everything much worse and we are forced to bear to see the consequences, to bear the loss of thousands of loved ones down here. 
many of whom spent their last days um, in overwhelmed hospitals with terrible conditions, and the remains were kept in refrigerated trucks as families mourned not being able to be there with their loved ones as they passed away. Here on the border, we also know a thing or two about immigration, living in a beautiful bicultural area of the country where everyone seems to have their own immigrant story. When Trump scapegoats immigrants and attacks them, it is our communities that are feeling the terror. When he closes the border to asylum seekers who are fleeing the consequences of US fail, uh, failed US domestic and foreign policies, we are the ones to mourn with the families when their bodies are found on the Rio Grande River banks. And on this and on many other issues, policy is always personal. And this is why conversations like these, when we're talking about national politics, it's so important because we, as communities on the Rio Grande River in our southern border, we're tired of being spoken about and not heard from. Folks in Washington and in other areas, other centers of power are used to making decisions that affect us in our day-to-day -day lives without consulting us. And we are the ones that are forced to bear with the consequences. Eh, por eso decimos que ya basta. We want elected officials and policies that have the best interests of our communities in mind, and we are organizing to hold them accountable and not, you know, force them to not neglect us any longer. We are raising our voices and because the two biggest values in South Texas are hard work and familia, we will continue to work hard and believe in ourselves as we fight to create the kind of society that protects and cares for our loved ones here on the South Texas border. So with that, last and but not least, I want to thank all the organizers on the ground for getting us to this point. We are absolutely excited to see all the effort being put into increasing voter turnout here in South Texas in order to turn Texas blue. But obviously we wouldn't be here without those folks on the ground who have been at it for years and investing in this area of Texas where many others felt it wasn't worth it or that we were insane for doing so. So with that, I'll kick it back so that we can hear from our amazing panelists who are proudly representing our Frontera every day. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jessica. And thanks for what you have done and are doing. Uh, our next panelist is Ophelia Alonso, Alonso. Uh, who resides in Brownsville and is the Rio Grande Valley El Paso Regional Field Coordinator for Texas Rising Action. Ophelia works primarily on youth leadership, voter engagement, and advocacy education. Ophelia, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you so much, Senator Sanders, for that introduction. I grew up in Brownsville, Texas as a non-citizen in a non-voting family. We saw firsthand how when electoral politics were talked about, we weren't the people they were talking to. And it wasn't until my father and I went through our citizenship ceremony that we realized that now we had access to a privilege that a lot of people in our families didn't have access to. And it was at that point at 18 years old that I saw that it was necessary for me to use my ability to vote to do so and reflect the values of my family and of my community. And it wasn't until I was a freshman in college that I realized that as a young person, I had the ability to change what my state looked like. And it was because of organizations like Texas Rising Action that I had the tools necessary to be able to confidently talk to people about the importance of voting, the importance of advocacy, and the importance of staying true to your beliefs and doing something about it. And now in my position, I get to work with hundreds of young people across the state of South Texas to do the same thing. And I've seen them lead the way in the way that our cities are changing. Young people are not only engaged voters, they are also here in the long term fighting for systemic change in the state of Texas. And Texas is changing too. Young people are going to make up almost 40% of the electorate. And we have seen in 2020 young people turn out at three times the rate that they did in 2016. Of those 900,000 voters, almost 40% are young people of color. This shift is going to change Texas beyond this election. Youth leadership and engagement does not end at the ballot box. We are here to make long-term change. And we need to continue to uplift young leaders in Texas. I have firsthand seen young people do more for their community than the governor, the attorney general, and the secretary of state in Texas. 
And we need to continue mobilizing our communities and make sure that our values in South Texas are reflected. Texas can and will be a more just, resilient, and equitable Texas. We will not stand for our families being ripped apart. We will not allow for a community to be militarized, polluted, or disparaged by this pandemic. And we will not stop after November 3rd. This is a lifelong commitment to justice. Our communities depend on it and our lives depend on it. So I ask you all to please get invested in community efforts to commit to the well-being of your family and neighbors. There is a future where we don't have to work two jobs to make ends meet, a future where we can guarantee a livable world for our children, a world where we don't have to lose our loved ones to police violence or health disparities. Young people like you and I can make that happen, but we need to turn out. We need to talk to our families about turning out. We need to use our roles as communicators and translators for our family units to make sure that our values are accurately represented in the state of Texas. And we are going to see that change. Thank you. Ophelia, thank you so much um, for that very powerful uh, statement. I just want to reiterate one point that Ophelia made. Young people in Texas today, as we speak, are transforming that state. And that is true all over this country. And as I have said many times, the younger generation in America, in, in Texas and all across this country, is the most progressive generation in the history of our country. It is a generation which is anti-racist, anti-sexist, anti-xenophobia, anti-homophobia, and anti-religious bigotry. It is a generation that believes in compassion and love. And we are seeing, the mo we are seeing what happens when young people in this country begin to stand up and fight back. They're gonna transform Texas, and I believe they're gonna transform this country. So Ophelia, thank you so much uh, for your remarks. Uh, it is now my pleasure to introduce uh, Doña Maria Gomez, who is a longtime farm worker activist with the United Farm Workers in South Texas. She began working in the fields at the age of 15 in Texas and followed the crop season to Wisconsin, Michigan, and other parts of Texas. She eventually joined the United Farm Workers and went from working in the fields to organizing for justice in the fields. And today she continues to fight for the rights of immigrants, farm workers, and working families across the Rio Grande Valley. Donia, thank you so much for uh, being with us. Gracias por esta oportunidad. Mi nombre es María Gómez. Uh, soy hija de padres migrantes. Tengo cuatro hijos. A los 15 años empecé a trabajar en el campo, donde empezaron a pagar 50 centavos la hora. Trabajamos en muchas cosechas, diferentes cosechas, con el estadón cortito. Estando trabajando en, en una labor de cebolla, llegó a la Unión de Campesinos. Y nos dijeron que salíamos en una huelga para mejores salarios. Entonces, ah, pues yo me salí junto con mis hijos y nos fue bien porque sí, ah, miramos que era bueno hacer una huelga para mejores salarios. I'm going to translate uh, here. Uh, my name is Maria Gómez. I live in Fart, Texas. I'm a daughter of immigrants. I'm also a proud mother of four. At the age of 15, I started working in the fields. We would earn 50 cents an hour and uh, for years work under uh, those wages, uh, working on the shorthanded hoe. Um, and that for those that are familiar with the shorthanded hoe, you're always on your back working all day. I work the onion fields, uh, tomato fields, cotton fields, you name it. It was there when I met people from the United Farm Workers who told us to boycott, to fight for better wages. Um, and together, this is an effort with not only myself, but with my family and my kids. Fue cuando entendí la necesidad de luchar para, para las mejoras de, de los campesinos que trabajaban en el campo. Entonces, ya de ahí, a yo me hice voluntaria en la Unión de Campesinos y empezamos a, a trabajar en las labores dando información a los trabajadores para que aprendieran a defender sus derechos. It is when I understood the need to fight for, for better working conditions. I began to volunteer with the union, organizing for clean drinking water, 
and restrooms out in the fields started reaching out to other workers. Cuando ya viajábamos para el norte o para Pecos para, para los trabajos, ya había aprendido un poco para poder pasar la voz y decirle a los campesinos que teníamos derecho de un mejor sueldo, de mejores viviendas, de mejores salarios, que era lo que muy bajo los salarios para nosotros los trabajadores del campo. As Doña María Gómez mentioned earlier in the introduction from Senator Sanders, she traveled to other states following the crops to states like Wisconsin, Michigan. So she took with her what she learned from the United Farm Workers here in Texas. She took those skills to other states uh, and began organizing workers in the Midwest uh, to fight uh, for their rights. And not only around um, farm worker rights, but to housing, to education, to healthcare. And, and just to add, because I, I know she didn't mention this, um, Doña Maria Gomez retired in 2011 from the union, but she hasn't really retired. <laughs> She's been, she continues to fight and push and go 100%. We're, we're, we're here in Clark, Texas near our union hall and she's here every day with us. Uh, so she continues to get out the vote. She continues to organize in her community, in her neighborhood. So I'm so, so proud to have the honor to translate for her today. Thank you. Gracias. Doña Maria, thank you. Muchas gracias. Um, and thank you very much for your lifetime of work uh, for justice, for agricultural workers. Um, you are a, an example to the younger generation of what uh, courage is about. So thank you very, very much. Uh, our next uh, panelist is uh, Virginia Palacios, who is an environmental science and policy consultant based in Laredo. Uh, she advocates for climate change solutions that address persistent health disparities uh, in the Latino communities. Virginia, thanks a lot for being with us. Thank you so much, Senator Sanders. On Tuesday, we have a chance to elect candidates who will act on climate, not only in the presidential race, but also down the ballot. Texas produces more greenhouse gas emissions than any other state, contributing to our nation's rank as the second highest emitter globally. In 2011, Texas had a historic drought. My dad made the decision to sell all of the cattle on our family's fourth generation ranch here in Webb County because there was not enough grass to feed them. National studies found that heat waves that year lasted longer and were more intense because of climate change. That drought cost Texas's agriculture sector $10 billion. Over more than 30 years in Laredo, there's been an increase in the number of days per year with extreme heat. This leads to more heat-related illness and death for people who work outside, like farm workers, construction workers, and energy sector workers. The oil and gas industry has been a big industry in Webb County, which produces more gas than almost any other county in Texas. But a lack of government oversight is harming our communities. A recent study looked at air pollution here in the Eagleford Shale and found that the odds of preterm birth were 50% higher for women exposed to high amounts of flaring pollution from oil wells. That happened here. And these results were only found for Latinas, not for any other racial or ethnic group. One of the most important climate races this year is the seat for Railroad Commissioner of Texas. This agency has nothing to do with railroads, but instead oversees Texas's oil and gas industry. Krista Castaneda is running for Railroad Commissioner of Texas on a platform to end routine flaring and reduce climate warming emissions from the oil and gas industry. Climate solutions on the border will look different than elsewhere. Here in Laredo, our population is 95% Latinx, we have a 30% poverty rate, and the percentage of people who are uninsured is three times the national average. Nationally, Latinas are the breadwinners in the majority of Latinx households, yet we earn only 54 cents for every dollar a white male makes. If Latinas were paid equally, we might be able to afford health insurance. This is a historic election, and when it is over, we must continue to make sure that our elected officials hear from us. There's so much at stake for border communities, and now is our time to lead the changes that will transform our future. Thank you.
Virginia, thank you very much for your work and for being with us tonight. Our next panelist is Ariel Gonzalez, who is a political science professor at South Texas College in McAllen. Uh, and Ariel uh, has been an advocate uh, for education equity. Ariel, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you so much, Senator Sanders, for the warm welcome. And it's great to see everyone here. And uh, thank you all so much uh, for the invite. So uh, I wanted to take, uh, um, I guess, a page out of uh, what Senator Sanders has done some, in some of these uh, some of these events. Uh, let me throw a little bit of trivia. Does anyone know the county that has voted for the most consecutive Democrat candidates? What's the current streak right now? Does anyone know what county that is? Just really quickly. Um, if not, let me tell you. Star County in South Texas. They have voted for every Democrat candidate since 1892. And so we want to keep that streak going, so much so that uh, my mom is going to take my 82-year-old grandmother to go vote on election day for Joe Biden. So uh, really excited about that. Um, anyway, uh, like the senator said, of course, I'm a uh, political science professor at South Texas College. I've, I've gotten to know a lot of the people here on this panel you know, with their uh, organizing. And uh, I also got to meet Jessica and helped her out in, in her campaign as well. Uh, so I, what I wanted to talk about uh, today was you know, kind of like the the successes and the challenges that we've had with you know education down here, uh, you know in the valley, um, you know from from what I've seen, you know as a professor here, uh, I've noticed that, and of course the numbers will also reflect this that we have had you know issues with you know voter turnout down here. You know when you compare it to, you know Texas is already a a, a uh, non-voting state already, but those numbers are even lower in South Texas. And what we've noticed is that you know when I get students you know coming to me. Um, they they want to get involved, you know. After you know, you know, we talk about you know the importance of voting and elections. They want to get involved, but they really didn't know how to, you know, until after you know they came to our class. So so you know what I propose we should do is we need to go out into the schools and we need to you know advocate you know for you know for you know for getting you know th this idea of you know civic engagement and making that you know a priority. You know uh, you know we can make it to where. Uh, you know, high school seniors can uh, register to be voter deputy registrars, you know, and, and colleges and universities are looking for that. They have to have certain, you know, hours for, uh, you know, you know, community service hours. They can put that on their, uh, on their applications and all that. So, so I feel that through the schools, we can definitely get, you know, that, that's a great avenue to get, you know, uh, higher voter turnouts. And then I also want to talk about, you know, the lack of access to broadband. Uh, you know, the, the census information can show that, you know, in South Texas, especially in these colonia areas, we are really lacking when it comes to broadband access, which has also been exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. But that was already a problem even before then. Uh, now, the, the school districts are, are doing a lot of innovations, like they'll send out buses with Wi-Fi access. But I mean, that can only go so far. I mean, they can't go everywhere. So what we need to do is we need to advocate for, you know, that stronger infrastructure to ensure that the students are able to you know, be able to be successful and have the tools that they need. And so, you know, that, that's, that's just, you know, my observations. And I feel that, you know, there's so much that we can do here in the Valley. And, you know, I, I know that we can, we can definitely get that done. It's a very bright future down here. Well, Ariel, while I have you on, let me ask you a question. Yes, sir. Uh, are you bumping into young people who simply cannot afford uh, to get a college education or are worried about leaving school deeply in debt. Is that an issue in your part of the world? Yes, that um, now thankfully, I mean, we do have uh, South Texas College, which is one of the most affordable colleges in the country. Uh, but that is something that, you know, I have those conversations with my students as a graduate student myself that has, uh, get this, 130,000 in student loan debt. I have those conversations with my students as well. And they tell me that they're feeling that as well, that, you know, they don't want to, they don't want to have to make that choice between bettering themselves, but still being shackled by that debt. I mean, it's kind of like a catch 22. They, they really, it, it's, un, it's unfortunate that they have to make that, that sacrifice. And so, yes, that is a problem that, that we are dealing with here in South Texas as well, that we have students that, um, because they just don't have the money to pay out of pocket, you know, and unfortunately, you know, well, I've got is, you have $130,000 student debt. Would you have a PhD? Uh, two masters. Um, two masters. Okay. But uh, but that masters got me this job as a as a professor, so it was well worth it. <laughs> but it's going to take you a few years to pay off uh, that debt, I imagine. Yes, sir. Yes, yes. Yes. 
All right, and one of the things uh, to the viewers out there that you should know uh, is that Joe Biden will take a significant step forward in reducing student debt in this country. And that should help Ariel uh, and many others uh, as well. Uh, Misty, do we have uh, some questions? Yeah, we do. We have a few questions. I want to start with some live questions. And we already met Danny earlier, but we did invite Danny. You know, Danny is a community organizer, former educator in FAR, Texas, um, and he just translated for Doña Maria. So, uh, Danny, uh, welcome back to the show. And what's your question for the panel? Uh, yeah, so this question is for uh, Senator Sanders and the rest of the panel. So, as mentioned, South Texas and the Rio Grande Valley have been dis disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. We've lost over 3,200 people, brothers and sisters, to the coronavirus here in the Rio Grande Valley, nearly a quarter of deaths for the entire state of Texas. More than a third of South Texans don't count with any health insurance, and thousands more are underinsured. It's normal here to see people organize fundraisers like chicken plate sales to help loved ones afford their care because they don't have care. It's normal to see people cross the border into Mexico to visit the doctor, the dentist, and buy cheaper medication. It's clear that we need, tr need to transform our healthcare system. What does that transformation look like in South Texas? How can we achieve this transformation in this country? Thank you very much. Uh, for that question, Danny. And that's a question that is on the minds of people, not only in South Texas, throughout Texas, but throughout the United States of America. And let me just mention to all of the viewers, uh, and I hope you know this, the United States of America spends twice as much per person on healthcare as do the people of any other major country. And yet 90 million people in this country are uninsured or underinsured. And we are the only major country on earth not to guarantee health care to all people as a human right. And that is why I introduced in the Senate a Medicare for all single payer program. And that is, Danny, where I think as a nation, we have got to go. And what Medicare for all says, similar to what exists 50 miles away from me tonight in Canada, is you go to any doctor you want, you go to any hospital you want, and you know how much, Danny, you have to pay out of your pocket? If you were in a hospital in Canada for two months with some terrible illness, do you know how much you pay out of pocket when you leave the hospital? Danny, you have any idea? Zero. I believe zero. Zero. <laughs> I hope everybody heard that loud and clear. Doesn't mean that healthcare in Canada is free. Of course, it has to be paid for but it is paid for out of the general tax base in the same way we pay for education, public education, police departments, fire departments, building roads, and so forth and so on. What Canada, Canadians believe, what people all over Europe believe is that healthcare is a human right, not a privilege. So in my view, we have got to fight and continue the fight for Medicare for all. And I'm happy to tell you we are making real progress on that. In terms of prescription drugs, we are now spending far, far more than any other country on earth because of the greed and power of the pharmaceutical industry. What I believe and Joe Biden believes is that here in the United States, we should not be paying more for medicine than they pay in Canada, in Mexico, or any place else. Now, I have to be honest with you and tell you that Joe Biden's views on healthcare are not the same as mine. But what he does believe is that we have got to expand healthcare coverage to tens of millions of people who today do not have it, that we have to lower the cost of healthcare, that we should double funding for community health centers, which is terribly, terribly important. And I'm a strong advocate of community health centers which means that people gain access not only to primary health care, but to dental care, which is a big deal, to low-cost prescription drugs, and very importantly, to mental health counseling. So the difference between Biden and Trump on health care is a mile wide. Trump wants to throw 22 million people off of health care by eliminating the Affordable Care Act and the protections we now have for pre-existing conditions. 
Biden wants to significantly expand health care. But Danny, at the end of the day, what we must have, and I believe we will have, is a Medicare for all single payer program. Thank you, Senator Sanders. Um, I'd like to move to our next question just so we can get a few others to chime in here. Um, our next question is coming from Abigail Avila, who's a college graduate joining us from Alamo. Alamo, probably. <laughs> Welcome, Abigail. Hello. Um, hi again, my name is Abigail and I'm from Alamo, Texas. And here in the RGV, there's only one abortion clinic with the second closest being 250 miles away in San Antonio. And even if distance wasn't already a barrier to overcome, there's also an internal checkpoint that cannot be crossed unless you answer whether or not you are a citizen. This second border boxes away my home, a mixed status community from the rest of Texas. And now with the recent appointment of Justice Barrett, the future of abortion access looks more uncertain than before. I'm nervous about the only clinic in my region being shut down again, leaving many people unable to access a time-sensitive healthcare procedure if they needed it, making it especially difficult for those that are low-income and non-citizens. My community, people I love, would be barred from accessing the health care they need. My question is, what does the future of abortion access look like in South Texas? Um, well, on that issue, uh, just as the overall issue of health care, uh, the differences between Trump and Biden are very, very wide. Trump is very strongly uh, against the right of women to control their own bodies. Uh, would defund Planned Parenthood, which provides excellent quality health care to millions of women, many of them being low-income women. Biden's review on that is radically different. He is pro-choice, understands, as I do, and as I think most Americans, that it must be women and not the government who have a right to control their own bodies, Biden is a strong supporter of Planned Parenthood. So, Abigail, uh, what I would tell you is that if the issue you are concerned about is the right of women to control their own bodies, that is an issue of enormous importance right now, with right-wing governors all across this country trying to make it harder for women to exercise their constitutional right. And we need a president who's going to be on the side of women. And I think that president will be Joe Biden. Jessica, I would love if you could chime in on this one. Do you have thoughts on this, being a woman in South Texas who ran for Congress? Yeah, definitely. I mean, this was an issue that we saw along the campaign trail. And it was something that um, people approached us maybe a little bit privately, right? And I think part of the work that we have to do in South Texas is to stop um, the stigma, right, of talking about abortion access. Um, I think a lot of people traditionally tend to think that this area is very conservative, right? And you, know, you talk about abortion and, you know, that's it, right? Um, it's, it's not a, a politically viable part of a platform or something like that. But I mean, I ran our, our campaign, I was unabashedly, you know, pro-choice, right? Because I knew that um, there were so many people, I won't say women, because we know that there are folks, right, who are able to get pregnant, um, that they couldn't, as, as Abigail mentioned, it was very difficult to get an abortion because, for example, in Laredo, you either tra travel down to the RGV to go get an abortion or you have to go up north, right, to San Antonio, and then you start thinking about, you know, the checkpoints, right? For, so for a brown woman who might be, you know, a non-citizen, um, it's difficult, right, to be able to, to get the, the health care that you need. Um, so part of the thing that I think we need to do moving past November 3rd is also pay attention to our local elections, right? Um, you know, when we're talking about activism and um, trying to pass laws that are actually going to expand health care, I mean, this is one of those, right? Because abortion is health care. And um, we're also talking about getting through laws that are that originated, right? The concepts um, from in the 956, <clears throat> which is Rosie's Law, right? Trying to make sure that, um, you know, programs like, for example, Medicaid does... Um, it does expand to cover uh, abortions as well, because it's not just, I think people tend to lump all of these things or try to, to separate them, right, and say, um, you know, focus on, on the issue of abortion, but it's not just that. We're talking about reproductive health in general. 
Okay. Miss Lee, do we have time for one more question? We do. Actually, we just have another question here that I'm going to go ahead and read out. And this comes from Denise from La Feria. Denise asks, no matter who wins November 3rd, we need to continue organizing around the issues we care about, but some of us are exhausted. Where do we start and how will we continue? Well, let me tell Denise, you ain't the only one who's exhausted. <laughs> uh, we have all been working very, very hard and uh, look forward to Tuesday for a number of reasons. All right, but Denise makes uh, a very, very important point and I just want to underline it. Tuesday is not the end of all of our problems if Biden wins. Uh, but what it does do is it opens the door for us to start going on the offensive in terms of starting to address the real problems that working families and low-income families have in Texas and all over the country. If Trump wins, we're going to continuously beyond the defensive, trying to stop them from doing this, trying to stop them from doing that. So I would a million times over much prefer to be on the offensive. Now, what does that mean? It means, as I mentioned to Danny a moment ago, health care is a human right. We need a Medicare for all single payer system that guarantees health care to everybody. We can do it when millions of people stand up and demand that we do that. Together, we're going to raise that minimum wage to at least 15 bucks an hour, make it easier for workers to join unions, equal pay for equal work for women workers. We're going to make public colleges and universities tuition free so that young people like Ariel do not have to leave school $130,000 in debt. And I've talked to people who graduated dental school $400,000 in debt. That's pretty crazy stuff. We don't have to do that if we change our national priorities, if we demand that the wealthiest people in this country start paying their fair share of taxes. We're going to deal with climate change. We're going to deal with immigration reform and stop the demonization of undocumented people and move toward a path toward citizenship. We're going to deal with criminal justice reform and police brutality. We're going to deal with sensible gun safety legislation. And as I mentioned a moment ago, we're going to move to make sure that women in this country have the right to control their own bodies. So the question that Denise just asked is exactly right. The fight continues. And the fight continues until we have a government based on the principles of justice, justice. Economic justice, people live with a decent standard of living, with health care. Social justice, meaning that we end bigotry and divisiveness in America. Racial justice and environmental justice, so that we end the kinds of pollution that is hurting and sickening so many of our neighborhoods, as well as deal with the crisis of climate change, et cetera, et cetera. So, there is an enormous amount of work to be done. And we can bring about those changes when millions of people stand together, black and white and Latino, Native American, Asian American, gay, straight, immigrant, native born. When we stand together, we are extremely powerful and we will use our power to transform this country. So with that, let me thank all of you in South Texas. Please, you got two days to go out and vote. Let's do that. Let's see Texas lead this country in getting rid of the most dangerous president in the modern history of America. Thank you all very much for being with us tonight.